Sui. All right. I can hear me. Testing. Sweet. <clears throat> Welcome back to yet another live stream of Bayesian Cognitive Modeling, where I learn how to do Bayesian inference um, following along by doing the exercises in the Michael Lee and Eric Wagemacher's textbook um, with the goal to better understand how to use Bayesian inference within the cognitive sciences specifically so I myself can incorporate and use these sorts of tools in my own research. <laughs> Last week on Bayesian cognitive modeling, we had just uh, done the first couple exercises and examples from the extra sensory perception chapter where we are interested in understanding um, or testing the effects of optimal stopping. So the implementation of researcher degrees of freedom for the precognition studies by Daryl Bebb. And what we did was we proved that there was evidence in favor of there being this negative relationship between um, the association of subject of uh, sample size and effect size, which is evidence for the use of optimal stopping, I believe, or at least that's where the the conclusion we drew. And then after that example, we moved into considering um, right, let me see. <coughs> we. We didn't do this, right? Evidence for the impact of extroversion. No, we did evidence for the impact. Evidence for differences in ability, right? So, Waga, right, we went over then Wagamacher's study, which attempted to look at the maximum effect. So they set up, they set up the study where, you know, if the uh, results were to correspond with what Ben found pri um, prior that we would see a really big effect. However, they didn't find any association between performance um, on the first time and the second time in a given subject who was also a woman, um, which was the uh, predicted or was the particular subpopulation that had the largest abilities to use precognition um, according to what Ben uh, has found them found <coughs> and so from there or we reasoned from there after doing a Bayesian hypothesis test where we used order restriction in order to test only for our values uh, larger than zero we did not find evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis and in fact found evidence um, in favor of a null hypothesis and we concluded then that there was little to no association between accuracy sessions so it was random chance from one session to another essentially and now we're, we're moving into looking at additional follow-ups um, that Wagemacher ended up considering after um, continuing to pursue critically evaluating the r results from Ben. So Wagenmacher, following a suggestion of Bem, also considered the possibility of being a positive correlation between performance and extroversion, right? Because it wasn't only women who had the highest abilities to use precognition or 
who we found evidence for precognition. It was women who were the most extroverted, right? I'm just looking for it. Sorry for all the scrolling. Right. So they found, Bem found, that people guessed the up and coming location of a picture above chance. Slightly. And this effect occurred only for the erotic photos and wasn't, it was absent for neuro, uh, neutral photos, which is why they did that in the Wagemacher study. They did the neutral versus erotic photos and they primarily looked at women and the, the effect was largest here in women that were extroverted. So now in conjunction with that, because Wagemacher wanted to maximize the probability of finding an effect he set up his experiment to demonstrate that well if there was an effect we'd see a very large effect because we were looking at women and we're going to be looking at extroversion so we should expect to see a positive correlation between performance and extroversion across subjects given that women our sample is of women and uh, women were the population or sample of interest that had the largest effect for precognition in the original study. So here, uh, the plot for figure 13, it show, shows us the extroversion scores and the positive or performance in session one. And we'd expect there to be a positive association between these two things where larger values of extroversion would mean better performance across sessions Yeah, across at least session one, right? But I could imagine there, we could extend this to session two, maybe, or maybe we will. All right, so just as before, we're gonna model performance. As we did up here, we modeled performance. Because, you know, performance is essentially just did you get it correct or not. But now, we also need to account for measurement error within our ability to capture uh, someone's extroversion. So in order to do that, we're going to go back to thinking about what we did in 5.2 and we think about extroversion being drawn from a Gaussian distribution and we'll assume that the standard deviation um, corresponds to the precision of the psychometric instrument. All right, so we'll have some average extroversion score and the variability surrounding that score is going to give us uh, some level of uncertainty for any given measurement of extroversion. And we can take a look at the graphical model that represents this idea here. But first, it might be of use to go back to 5.2 because it says, you know, it's an approach we considered in 5.2. So just to make the connections between the material, I'm just gonna go ahead and jump back look at 5.2 really quick right so we 5.2 and we considered the Pearson correlation coefficient here was the graphical model for just looking at a correlation and then we wanted to instead say that our measurements for in this case I think it was our measurements of intelligence and response time we wanted to model additional uncertainty surrounding those things so <coughs> the precision of the measurement was captured by these two terms by our lambda terms which were known which we just specified um, in this particular example we just specified some precision terms um, based on what we knew in the literature to be representative of that. 
and then we said that the values were um, drawn from a Gaussian distribution. So we're going to do this for extraversion scores ij or extraversion scores and the the data the version to come we're going to be drawn from a gaussian distribution with some mean which is going to be a multivariate gaussian distribution and the known precision parameters so keeping this in mind let's go take a look at the example now for chapter 13 or so Right. So taking a look at the example then here. This time, the success rates. Right, so for each subject. This is going to be extraversion, and extraversion is going to be distributed by a Gaussian distribution with theta i2, so for a given subject, and it's the second uh, parameter in the model with some known precision. So we are going to specify what the uncertainty is surrounding our measurements for extraversion. And then we're going to have some set amount of trials and successes for each subject. And from the information surrounding the success rate and the average for the extraversion score for the subject, we're going to get a multivariate Gaussian distribution uh, which jointly is going to capture the averages of the two success rates along with their standard deviations, um, with their variances and covariances. And that's going to give us all the information we need in order to get an average and a sigma for these, for these success rates, right? Oh, no, 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 these go into there, sorry. It's going to give us all that we need in order to get uh, the correlation coefficient um, while accounting for information about extraversion and accounting for uncertainty in our measurement of extraversion. So let's take a look at the... the text. I see. So the trick we're using in order to capture uh, theta sub i2 is we're using a probit transformation, or I don't know what this is, phi? Right, we're using phi to make sure. Yeah. We use phi in order to scale the theta parameter um, so that it is um, like between 0 and 1. And so that when we multiply by 100, then uh, this ensures that our extraversion score is going to be on a scale from 0 to 100 here, where 
if we were to get a low, low rate, so like a zero here, then we would get a zero scale score, right? But if we got a one here, for example, then we would get a hundred. So that helps. Those are like the two boundary conditions for uh, the possible options for our estimated uh, theta s sub i2. And so multiplying by 100 here ensures that we're capturing the uh, proper scaling of extroversion in this case. And that is going to represent our mean value here in our Gaussian distribution for a given subject's uh, extroversion score. And we use Gaussian here just to remind you because once we get this score for extroversion, then we just want to account for some level of uncertainty, which we're going to a priori specify. And it looks like in our case, we're going to use one over nine. When the standard deviation is three for extraversion measure are shown in blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm going to open up the code then before we walk through this because this is standard, just assigning each of the cells in the variance covariance matrix and then doing the matrix inversion in order to get our final matrix here. Do we do the very inversion and to get our, our sigmas and, and rows and r's? <laughs> This is just reparameterizations of the precision that we specified above, right? And then these are just uninformative and these are uninformative prior distributions. And then the parameterization for the data here, theta. For each subject, we'll have theta p i 1 and 2, which is a multivariate mu, boom. This is just the specifying the original this. And then we also have theta for 1, theta for 2. which are just equal to things that we pull from this bigger one, right? And this should be the same, yep. And then we have x, which we specified is equal to this. And lambda, lambda is something we specify as known. And k is a binomial, this from here number of trials. So we bring in n number of trials and we're bringing in lambda. Good. And then we have information about x and k. Cool. That looks good. All right, so the four nodes. Okay, so now let me open the code. And the code is x version. Okay. P. I'm going to set my uh, working directory. I'm going to open extraversion JAG. I'm going to open extraversion text. Okay. Let's take a look. Okay. 
So here, this is exactly what we talked about. The JAGS code is exactly the same. Matrix inversion, specifying the multivariate distribution here, using the DM um, norm, DM norm function. And then we take a look at the data, our JAG, and we have the success rates for each of the subjects. It looks like we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Four, three, 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 ten, nine. Okay. I guess that's easier. A hundred values there. <laughs> And then X, X is the extroversion scores, success, this is performance on the test or the, the first um, block of trials. And we want the N number of subjects, N number of trials, and then sig max. Why do we need sig max? Right. We need sig max in this case just because we do one over sig max squared. It's going to be a lambda. And then here's the data, the values that need to get plugged in, number of trials, number of subjects for the for loop, number of trials, and x, x and k, and the two of the four observed. And then we need to initialize the variables. So we initialize r, we initialize two mu's and two lambdas, and we're running two chains. So we do this twice. And then we specify the parameters that we want to monitor uh, throughout the sampling. And here we go. Here is the sampling. And it looks 10,000 iterations. OK. And two chains. It might be long. Wow. So I just, if you saw it went from 46 to 96, I just closed Zoom on my computer because it was still open for my last meeting. And did that, boy, did that change the amount of time. I will say though, it is still chugging along, but I've been pretty rough on my, my PC today on my Mac today. It's been running a lot of sampling stuff. I wonder if it's stuck or something. It might be stuck. Nope, oh, nope. Just kidding. And I like to take a look. I'm just going to print the samples. For all those data. I just want the averages. All right. Here's the 
average score and then average extroversion score. Here's the correlation, which contains zero. And here are the variability, and then here are the thetas for each subject for each of the two parameters. So here are the success rates for subjects. And then here are these, the extroversion parameters for each subject. Thing, but this would give all the extroversion averages and the uncertainty surrounding each of those estimates for the subject, which is cool. I think we can get a, a readout on someone's score, but also give a assessment of potential variability within that score <coughs> though that being said it is sort of arbitrary given that our precision parameters is something we a priori specified and you know i imagine that it's influencing the variability of the spread for the uncertainty for each of the scores i mean that's what it controls right Anyway, plot R, because that's what we care about. Hmm. Looks like this is the hypothesis test against the Bayesian prior evidence in favor of the, uh, um, the null hypothesis. The null is... two times more likely and now we can make some plots and there's a plot so two times more likely than the posterior distribution I think so. Let's see. Shows the density. Black and white. The density posterior is about three times greater than that of the prior at this point. So the base factor is three in favor of the null hypothesis that the correlation is zero. Okay, when the standard deviation is three for extraversion, the left hand pointer shows <sighs> prior posterior distributions. Uh, prior posterior posterior is about 0 0.16 the mode is 12 uh, that's the mode so the so that's the mode this is the mean right or the posterior expected value 
whatever you want to call it. And when we observe the evidence, the prior is about three times greater than that of the prior. Posterior is three times greater than that of the prior. So the base factor is three in favor of the null hypothesis. I'm just trying to think about how to interpret that, right? So we've observed data, and now we have a larger density for zero in the posterior distribution. And thus, because the posterior distribution is representative of our updated beliefs about the probability of zero, there's evidence from our posterior distribution in favor of the separate but related or separate but specified and distinctly from the null hypothesis that being that the association between extroversion and accuracy in the first session is high or not zero or Sorry, the null hypothesis is that the association between those two variables is zero. And there's evidence to support that. Right? That's what we found. So what to conclude about whether or not the correlation is zero? Uh, I conclude that the correlation, it's likely that the correlation is zero, or there's evidence that the correlation is zero. And f there's evidence in favor of, of a no association between the two. So we can try more extreme accuracies. Okay, so we can go and do that and see how that changes the base factor. So let's change. Because one squared is one, two. So if we run this, it's running a little faster. there oh I guess what do I expect oh, turn it from there change the precision to one fat it's gonna be like this kind of distribution if I'm not mistaken Looks like the distribution isn't influenced that much by our specification of the parameter, right? Wow. Well.
try this. And in this case now, given that we didn't see much of an influence in the change in the precision from the last case, I'm going to also now predict that our the evidence is strong enough that the in intro the additional pre precision here isn't going to make a difference and in fact I would say that in this case, um, ch the change in the precision that we made uh, will actually make the base factor even more in favor of the pro of the null hypothesis. Boop. Let's see it. Interesting. So I got it backwards. Okay. So the first case when we turned it to one and lambda is equal to one, then we got similar results. But when we change lambda to zero one instead, now the prior distribution, now the ultimately the posterior distribution is quite more diffuse and there is not there is substantially less evidence in favor of there being no association between the two and in part that is because we introduce additional uncertainty into our measurement of extroversion. So there's still evidence in favor of the null hypothesis here, though it is substantially smaller um, because of the variability um, that became larger due to our prior specification of sigma All right so we added more variance this ad added additional uncertainty though not enough uncertainty to uh, change the conclusions of the analysis though certainly enough to change the results for the correlation here I mean, right? So there's, there's a much wider uh, range of possible um, scores for the correlation coefficient. Though uh, this in part also note that this in part also extends in both directions. So we're moving and showing more cases where R is below zero now and cases where r is much more above zero than we expected using our other distribution for our s uncertainty surrounding our estimates for extroversion. Cool. So that's that problem then. So the Bayes factor um, stays the same for one, but decreases for two. Decreasing here mov meaning moving against evidence in favor of the null hypothesis. Though we ultimately still find that there's no effect. All right, 
Now we're going to move into a new case study, it looks like. Um, we have enough time to start it, so it will at least do the background reading for this model. It looks interesting. I don't know much about trees. Oh, but it looks like we're going to generate some sort of factor structure here. That's cool. Yeah, because look, we're going to get average variability for our given items. Huh. Okay. Let's see what this one's about. I consider a free recall task in which people study a list of words. Okay. And then you want them to recall the words in any order. So interestingly, when people do this sort of free association or f and then recall of words, the words tend to that people recall. Oh, when people f recall a series of words that are associated um, in an order that they um, can specify themselves, there's this interesting, interesting property of how they end up specifying or re recalling the words, and that's that s words that are similar to one another are recalled together, and then you have these words that are singletons that are recalled on their own. So, so the, the, here's a standard finding, semantically related words are recalled um, consecutively. So when they're close to one another, so a person might recall soccer, cat, dog, table, doctor, nurse. So you see in this k example, we have s two singletons, that being uh, soccer and table. Th and we had two pairs of words that were semantically related to one another, that being cat, dog, and doctor and nurse. So this demonstrates the finding that you know, th words that are semantically related are recalled uh, consecutively. So they must be, maybe they're stored in some way that makes it so that it matches this pattern. Um, and that's why we recall them close to one another. So it's some theory about the potential, potential structure for semantic um, relationships between pairs of or sets of uh, like terms. And here is the multinomial process tree. It looks like we're going to talk about that right below. Multinomial process trees provide one approach to modeling these memory effects. So the clustering that we just described above can be captured using multinomial process trees. So it's these cognitive events that um, are derived from these word pairs. So there's some probability. I think C is it's cluster storage. Okay. And then the inverse of cluster storage. So one minus cluster storage. And then within that. So this just talks about recall of clustered pairs, but we can also incorporate information about singletons. 
So the model here, let me show the model, but also read the paragraphs. Okay. The model considers four categories. All right. So first, both are captured. Okay, so categories are represented by C, but the big C. So big C one, big C sub one is when we recall word pairs consecutively. Big C sub two. Both words are captured in big C sub two, right? Big C sub three, only one word, and then big C sub four, no words. And then the tree represents all the beh the behavioral outcomes that can occur from these um, sequences, four sequences in this case. Represented by C, R, U are the three parameters. So the cluster storage parameter is the probability that a word pair is clustered. So the probability a word pair is clustered. And then we have a probability that the word pairs are not clustered. And then U, or R is first, the cluster retrieval parameter is the conditional probability that a word pair is retrieved from memory given it was clustered. So given they were on this side of the tree, now the re cluster retrieval parameter is like, what's the probability that these two pairs are clustered or retrieved? given that they're clustered. And then there's another conditional probability here, U. which is the conditional probability a member of the word pair is stored and retrieved from memory, given it's not as a cluster. So we're looking at the probability, excuse me, we're looking at the probability that a word pair was either clustered or not, and then the probability that the word pair was retrieved, given it was clustered, or the probability that the, the word is unique given it was not clustered. Um, and then it looks like we have multiple, oh, given though it wasn't unique, though, given it was unique. I'm wondering why we have this double um, leaves like the additional layer of the, tr the, tr the tree in this case I'm not sure what it represents because we have one two three and four can be represented just here but then we have two more cases of three and four or we have a case of four that can also arrive if the words were clustered we could still not retrieve them but if the words weren't clustered we they could still not be unique right yeah or they could still not be uniquely retrieved So the multinomial processing tree offers an account for the number of times words are recalled 
according to different categories of behavior controlled by the cognitive processes represented in the tree. So we can have three or we have these four categories and you can see that for a given trial, you have recall for each of the four categories. Wait, let's see, let me make sure. Mm. Let's contextualize that datum better because it looks like up, trial one, two. Just what's up to Room roommate says, sub to chat. <laughs> <laughs> So here you're seeing the uh, results for three example trials from the Reifer paper. Okay, so most analysis rely on categorical category response data. So this is free recall data. And it's three trials from free recall data across 21. So the whole data set is 21 subjects. And they respond to 20 category related word pairs in a series of six study test trials. So they do six study test trials. Each trial features the exactly the same word materials. It therefore seems reasonable to expect that all three model parameters will increase over trials. I see. So we're doing free recall from categories uh, six times. And we'd expect then that there'd be some level of learning here where I see. So at first, we're not seeing clustered or unique retrieval is really high for that first trial. So you see that over time here as within a subject, they learn more or the, this could be accounted for by learning or some kind of memory consolidation, but we're getting more trials that are representative of clustered pairs with um, some probability of retrieval. So we have uniform priors, and then we're going to generate thetas for four. Why four? Okay. Four, because this is how we estimate the probabilities, these four values. So the probabilities for four response categories. It's the probability of cluster one, cluster two. So this is just representing each of these four response where the probability of category given these parameters. And we're drawing from a multinomial distribution K represented by each of these 
success rates and the n number of trials in total I'm just aggregating the data this is across a range of subjects right yeah this is not by subject we have no subject information here this is just the all the data brought together across the aggregated over subjects and items okay so we're not getting that much data or information from these rates right because we're aggregating across sources so that's weird Uh-oh. It doesn't look like you can implement this one. So there doesn't seem to be some way to implement this one in R. MPT underscore R. MPT underscore Huh. I got a bug. Maybe we'll we'll go take a look and see if we can find the Jags code. In addition to the implementations in the book, this just tells me what the these do so this one is going to give the it's going to do it in the way the book does it I know those are old school so I'm just going to change them now So we're going to data, it's going to be end, lower bound, one. So we have to have at least one, and then we can have a success rate. We're going to have four of them. Lower bound, zero, upper bound, n. Success rate can't be higher than the number that we have. That makes sense. We can't recall more words than what we have. For each of the parameters, R is going to be bound 0 and 1. It's probabilities. And then we use a simplex for the theta that we specified above. Or no, we don't specify that above. But we're going to have four theta parameters. And we're going to use a simplex here to specify. And then within it, we're going to call and then write out each of the specifications for each of the corresponding uh, categories um, and now we'll set uniform priors here 
and then we do k as multinomial and this should work nicely this looks pretty simple so k is here the four k's let's see where are you getting these k's 45 24 9 7 2 3 4 yeah, there's the four Ks. We get the sum of the Ks. Looks like we're only analyzing those Ks. I see. We have to do each of the Ks one at a time. And here's the posteriors for each of them. All right, we're gonna just model three of the trials. All right, so we're gonna have four categories, but notice how we're modeling each of the trials independently of one another, which might not be the most efficient approach. Uh, sorry. Okay, and it looks like it finished here. Chain. It went pretty quickly, yep. So that's just the first chain. I'm just gonna run the next two chains now. And those are in very quickly, wow. And now we just extract C, R, and U, C, R, and U, and C, R, and U. And this won't work, because I'm on a window. Layouts, plots, Cool. There you go. Should be. Maybe we do it like this. Cool. So trial one, two, and six. We're capturing the three parameters. Um, the cluster retrieval, the clustering, the retrieval, and the uniqueness. So what do we see is that as we increase, as subjects move from the first trial to the last trial, the probability that words cluster increases. So this is an effect of like, semantic retrieval potentially here where words um, after you're exposed to them more often you're seeing this increased probability in the retrieval of those words or the identification of those words as being clustered with one another in terms of retrieval retrieval also skyrockets as we move across trials with um, aggregated across subjects here starting with a fairly low retrieval rate for the clustered cases though substantially increasing to a fairly precise and high probability, where one, I imagine, means that for every uh, clustered pair, we are also retrieving it. Additionally, we are also just seeing a, a general increase in ac across all of our parameters in as we move forward in the trials. So um, in the last one, the unique which I believe is just a conditional um, unique storage retrieval parameter, the conditional probability that a member of a word pair is stored and retrieved from memory given that the word pair is not stored in a cluster. So we're also retrieving unique word pairs that aren't um, clustered too. So that increases as well. We increase across all three parameters. That's cool.
So what do you conclude from the posteriors? Oh, we, we are learning. That's what I conclude. Words would be word pairs are becoming more clustered. We are learning, though additionally, unique words are also being recalled more frequently. Um, or the probability of words that are unique are also um, across the sub sample being recalled more frequently. So all three parameters are increasing. But you can see, right, so I think the my big point here too, because, you know, any parameter that is hitting its maximum, like R right here, that's just showing that recall of clustered pairs are really benefiting from practice All right, because we can call changes or moving from trial one to trial two to trial six this is like practice effect being demonstrated within the parameter space here So because U is the unique, unique, right? What is its name? The unique storage retrieval. Okay, so the unique storage retrieval parameter corresponds to both storage and retrieval of the unclustered words and is typically regarded as a nuisance parameter. That's what I've figured. It doesn't seem like that interesting because we're interested in recall for clusters. Um, right. In an approach to Bayesian inference that's not fully Bayesian, uh, the lack of interest in the posterior distribution of U might lead to a shortcut of reasonable values being substituted rather than assigning a prior. So instead of doing like some prior distribution here and modeling U or changes in U, we could just specify some value for U. Is that what it's saying? Modify the graphical model so that U is set to a constant for each trial given by the expected value of the posterior from the fully Bayesian analysis. How does this change the posterior for CNR? I assume that they might decrease. Or uh, I'd assume that it's dependent on There's no implementation of this in R. It's interesting. Don't want to do the latent trees one. <laughs> huh. So we'll just change the stand code. Instead, here. Look up how to set a constant in stand code.
I'm just looking to specify a single term. I have, I have this book that I have some stand code. We just we're removing this. Okay, center.
looking at the MATLAB code. Yeah, right. Yeah. It didn't break right away. Now I officially have edited the code. So what I did was I didn't I removed the initializations here from the chain because we're not going to be sampling uh, across U because we set U to be constant. And then I told oh it crashed. <laughs> wow. Okay. 
So we crashed. Here we go. We're back. Tonight's documentary night. But yeah, I'm not sure why it crashed there. But if it crashes again, then I think we know. Oh. Failed to create the sampler. Uh, maybe we turn this to a real value. We actually I think this actually just stays here like that. Let's see what else we got. Cause it's still a parameter, right? It's not data. Mm. Yeah. And I pass it on the stem here, so stem knows what u equals in the parameter space, but it still needs to be here because it is in one of the transform parameters here. Oh, and it worked. Sweet. Okay. So that's it. still get pretty large clustering values here. I'm going to set the nuisance to 5. Let's see what happens when I set it to uh, Let's see if it's running Heroku. Also, I think it is. Crash. I'm not seeing that much change. I want to check just to make sure that this just is not an issue. So you barely nuisance, we're not changing our estimates that much, if at all, across the samples or across the trials. And we vary you. So that's a sort of pen sensitivity analysis that demonstrates that you is a, s is a nuisance parameter. If we're not interested in it, we could hold it constant. At least in this case, it seems like it would be okay. Hmm. Alright, so next time we're going to uh, keep moving forward and do latent traits.
you know, it's like multi-memory processing trees, but now we're gonna introduce this idea of there being latent traits as well. And this looks super, super cool, so I'm excited to get right into that tomorrow. Uh, thanks for sticking around today. Mm, have a great rest of your evening. Mm, I'll see you tomorrow.